Um, all right, so <laughs> because of the pandemic, I probably spend more time in this lecture than I should have. So I'm gonna record it for everybody. And we'll talk about retinal dystrophies following the basic science book. And so inherited retinal dystrophies, we're gonna go through the introduction, classification schemes, you know, evaluation management, genetic testing, and then we'll talk about four different general categories of dystrophies, the diffuse dystrophies, choroidal dystrophies, macular dystrophies, and inner retinal dystrophies. So to start with, we're gonna talk about classification schemes. So this is, there's mostly they're done topographically or you can do layer of involvement or two choices. And if you look at the picture at the right of your screen, if you're doing it topographically, what would that be a macular or a diffuse dystrophy do you think? Macular. Macular, good. And then how about this one? Diffuse. Diffuse, good, so it's not that hard. So the macular ones are in the middle and the diffuse or peripheral ones are in the periphery. Layer of involvement is not used as much. I mean, there's retinal RP and choroidal dystrophies. Um, the RP ones are less common, but the but problem is that's, once they've been there for a while, everything gets involved. So the layer of involvement's not as useful, I don't think. And then um, there's inheritance pattern. And basically you have either your autosomal or X-linked. So you can have autosomal dominant or X-link dominant of which there's only one that affects the eye that I could find, which would be a great trivia slash board question, <laughs> which is incontinentia pigmenti because it's, um, it's lethal for males, unless you have someone who has Kleinfelder and then you could actually have a male with X-link dominant incontinentia pigmenti. And the, the retina looks like fever. I don't, I've not seen a patient with incontinentia pigmenti, but I've had patients with fever. So that color picture is mine of a patient with fever. And then um, that's a picture I found of someone's skin with incontinentia pigmenti. Um, and then there's, so there's autosomal dominant, X-link dominant, autosomal recessive, X-link recessive, and then there's mitochondrial, which doesn't really come up in this lecture, but it comes up a lot in the syndromic lectures. And you can ask questions or talk. Um, evaluation and management. Um, uh, the autofluorescence is very helpful in inherited retinal diseases. And I've actually, for the most part, gotten away from getting fluorescein angiograms and just getting autofluorescence on most of my patients with the dystrophies, and then maybe color and OCT. Um, dystrophies are always symmetric. So this is a patient with a dystrophy. This is a patient with a dystrophy. And this is a patient with a dystrophy. And they may look different from each other, but the, the two eyes look almost exactly the same. If it's not symmetric, like this patient, then it's probably not a dystrophy. So if you look at this eye on this side of the screen, it's all abnormal and messed up, and this eye is completely normal. So that's, that's probably, what I end up pegging most of these patients with is uh, Azor. Even though this has all the findings, there's almost like a bullseye starting there and everything, it still is not a dystrophy. So if it's atypical or asymmetric, you want to rule out treatable diseases. So vitamin A deficiency, which is uncommon. Autoimmune disorders, which I've been seeing lately. Uh, paraneoplastic, which is really autoimmune, and then infections. So this picture on the right of your screen oops, is a 91-year-old patient who's been seeing me for a year or two now. She came in when she was 89 or 90 with these shimmering scotomas. The autofluorescences show what could be a dystrophy. There's these you know, brightness and then these rings, but she had an autoimmune retinopathy. And um, we've been, I gave her a posterior satin on catalog. She's been pretty stable, but so you can get other things that look like dystrophies. Um, clinical evaluation, the most helpful things are a retro, electroretinography, which I have not and never have gotten and probably never will get on a patient, but I'm gonna try to teach it some, so be forgiving if I mess it up. And then uh, autofluorescence, which we get constantly, optical coherence tomography, and then visual field testing. The um, thing you should know about autofluorescence is you might want to, it's very bright and unpleasant. So you should probably try getting one of yourself before you get them on the patients. And I like to go easy on the photography on dystrophy patients. So I tell the staff to get an autofluorescence, but really just to get one, not to keep shooting a million pictures. Um, and then clinical evaluation, and the, this is from your textbook, the, the three important ones they mentioned 
where distinct phenotypes were Bietti's crystalline dystrophy, which is extremely rare, uh, and then retinitis punctata albescens, which is pretty rare, and choroideremia, which is rare. Those all have distinct phenotypes that match the gene. So if you look at this picture, what is this a picture of? This is one of the distinct ones. It's fluorescein angiogram on a patient with a dystrophy. Choroideremia? Yeah, so that's a typical choroideremia because you're seeing the choroidal capillaris is shot and you're seeing the choroidal vessels. And then this one on the right, I, I hate to get excited when patients come in with problems, but this was kind of a family I saw, uh, a Middle Eastern family a couple of years ago. And what's that over there? Punctata albescens? Yeah, yeah punctata punctata. albescens. Exactly, perfect. And those are listed as two of your distinct phenotypes. And the other ones aren't really distinct. We are not covering, this would take years, we're not covering syndromic diseases. Um, so we're not doing these ones. This is chapter 14, which we'll do someday. And then also there's another chapter for con congenital and stationary retinal diseases, um, which we're not covering, which is very short. So we probably could just throw that into a lecture later. Um, management of dystrophies, you, there is something to manage. I find it interesting. The incidence of retinitis pigmentosa is about one in 4,000, and we have a million people in Pinellas County, so there should be, you know, hundreds of these patients out there, right? Yeah, four, there should be, you know, several hundred. But I, we hardly see them, and, and retinitis pigmentosa patients don't like coming in for eye exams. So even though it's not uncommon, but so I generally do an every one or two year exam, more like two years, and tell them to come in if their vision's worse, and mostly you're doing making sure the refraction's right, which I don't do that. But also CME is not uncommon. 10 to 20% of patients can get CME. And that can respond to treatment. So you can make them better. Um, cataracts happen, glaucoma happens. And I've not seen a Coates reaction, but apparently it's not uncommon. And then other things happen. I have to say, I have a patient who came in once who was told nothing could be done for her. She went for four or five years with vision loss and she came in and she had posterior capsular opacities that were almost hand motion in both eyes and someone lasered her capsule and she saw, it. so it was magical. So, so it is important, I think, to see people back and even now, now especially because of the genetics. Um, this is a patient who came in to see me, I'm missing the top of my thing, um, with vision loss in the right eye. And here's her pictures. I did a fluorescein on her because of the swelling. She's got a little bit of cysts there. It's a dystrophy, they're symmetric. And then she's got the macular edema from her dystrophy. So I did treat her. She had had recent cataract surgery. So I tried her on anti-inflammatory drops, which is these first three panels, and it didn't get better. And then I did switch her to the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and the macula dried up. And the vision improved. I have to say I went from 2040 to 2025. Um, so, and then the thing it lists in the textbook for treatment is counseling, genetic counseling, low vision aids, and rehabilitation. And it is important to remember low vision aids. I mean, we're good at it for retina specialists. I think I, I get, you know, nice thank you cards from all our low vision specialists because I always push people into low vision. But, you know, don't ever let somebody go and say there's nothing that can be done because there's a lot that can be done. It's sort of like if someone has had a hip replacement and they can walk with a walker, um, you know, it makes a big difference giving people aids that can help them. Um, okay, so that's the treatment. Let me see. Okay, I'm ready to go. Okay, so next we're gonna to get to genetic classification, which is a big deal. Now, there's 750 genetic disorders that affect the retina and the choroid, which is a lot. Three, this, is at the, this is as of this writing, I think. It's probably a little bit old. Uh, 300 retinal degenerations where the, a chromosomal defect has been identified. And there's, oh, this is a rhodopsin molecule. There's actually over 100 distinct mutations in rhodopsin that cause uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So there's a lot of genetics being done in retinal dystrophies. <clears throat> These are genetic terms that are from the textbook. Um, genetic heterogeneity is when you have multiple genes that cause a single phenotype, which is like in retinitis pigmentosa, there's hundreds and hundreds of genes. They all look like retinitis pigmentosa. And then variable expressivity is when you have a single gene that causes different phenotypes. And this is true at least I know of the ABCA4, the Stargardt's gene, can cause retinitis pigmentosa. So you can have Stargardt's, but some of the same families will have retinitis pigmentosa. 
And then pleiotropy, which is actually, if you take the quiz, which I'd like you to do on this chapter, ignore that question because it's, it's a little bit misdefined in the book. Pleiotropy is when a single gene causes several problems in the same patient. So it's more of something you see in syndrome. So in someone with albinism, <clears throat> where the gene defect causes problems in the eye and the skin. So those are more the syndromic, and that's pleiotropy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, gene therapies become a big deal in the eye. In uh, late 2017, the FDA approved Luxturna <clears throat> for patients with uh, RP65 mutations, which is seen in Libra's, Libra's congenital amaurosis. And now there's a lot of treatments being tried. There's over a dozen gene therapy trials underway. A lot of the gene therapies have to do with the adenovirus, adenovir AAV, adenovirus associated virus. It's an, it's an excellent vector. It's got no pathogenicity. It can infect non-dividing cells. And it, it, it's interesting because it stably integrates into the host genome at a specific site in chromosome 19. So it's not like a typical retrovirus, which just shoves itself in anywhere and cause cancer if it goes into a bad place. This vector goes in predictably. So it's a very nice vector that's going to be used for a lot of genetic therapies. Is and gene only, therapies, go ahead. Is it only used for chromosome 19? My understanding from my brief reading is that it, at the moment, the AAVS1 um, integrates into chromosome 19 into a safe, oh no, adenovirus-associated vectors integrate into chromosome 19 to a safe spot. Because hmm. you can, you know, gene therapy, you can just put a gene into it. You don't have to integrate it. There's all sorts of things. You can put genes into the nucleus and just let them float around and express. And you can actually try to push them in without viruses. There's lots of ways to do this. But the AAV looks like it's going to be the probable mechanism going forward. Um, and genetic testing is important. It's got a high positive predictive value, but a low negative predictive value because a lot of mutations aren't detected. Um, but if you find a detection, it's good. If you find a, a mutation, it's good. The, um, there's a kit you can get. I, I'll, I'll, if you need this, I'll email it out to you, where Spark Therapeutics right now is funded partly through a grant from, I think, Foundation for Fighting Blindness. And your patients can get free testing for 250 genes, which is pretty nice. It's a pretty good panel. Um, and the, but the thing is, when you start getting the testing, you're going to get these variants of unknown significance, which can be a challenge um, to interpret. At the moment, it's not a big deal because the only thing you can treat is RPE65. If you have an RPE65 positive patient, my understanding at the moment is that the treatment's only covered if they have both genes involved. And then, they, then the treatment's covered because it's expensive. So this is an 82-year-old woman I saw. She was 20-32 in this eye, light perception in the left eye, family history sounded like autosomal dominant RP. Um, so I got a genetic test, and this is what I just got back. This came back um, a couple of weeks ago. And this is typical, so it was negative, essentially. So there was variants of unknown significance identified. There was a bunch of heterozygous defects found in genes that may or may not be important. So this was essentially negative, and that's very common to get these VUSs back. But you can get positive back too. Um, current trials available are achromatopsia, choroideremia, Libra's congenital amaurosis is still enrolling some trials, and then these other ones down here, retinoschisis. I've tried getting, I tried getting a choroideremia patient into a, a study which was closed. I tried getting two retinoschisis patients into a study. One was too young and one study was closed. And I've tried getting Stargardt's patients in the studies. So a lot of the studies are very small, but you can look on clinicaltrials.gov or try to find us. If you do find a, com a positive gene defect, I've been emailing Byron Lamb down in Miami because he's been involved with a lot of their studies, but unfortunately I haven't gotten a bite on anything yet for my patients. Um, and then the hope is with the, this is not there yet, but the hope uh, is in Tanner? the future, Tanner? that we'll have, uh, uh, we'll move from these eponyms to, um, okay, to no gene problem. defects. So you'll have, I'm hearing some, I think it's Harry. Um, so G, instead of saying type two Libra's congenital amaurosis, we'll say RP65. Instead of saying Stargardt's disease, we'll be say RBCA4 related retinopathy, but that's not the way the world is right now. Um, 
Dr. And so Kim. that's it for introduction. So the next thing I'd like to get to is classification of diffuse dystrophies, which is mostly retinitis pigmentosa. So under diffuse dystrophies, there's six different we're going to talk about briefly. There's retinitis pigmentosa, which is, it's not an infection or an inflammation. So the retinitis term isn't favored. So rod cone dystrophy is the favored terminology, but I don't think that, I don't know if people are ever going to switch. Cone and cone rod dystrophies, Leber's congenital amaurosis has its own little page because of the gene therapy. Enhanced S cone syndrome is very rare, but we'll talk about it. Choroideremia, gyrate atrophy, and Vietti's crystalline dystrophy. So this first patient's a 55-year-old female. She was diagnosed 30 years ago with an inherited retinal disease, and her vision's good. She has an autosomal dominant pattern, it looks like. No one's been tested. So this is the right eye. And you can see the eye's not normal. The vessels are thin. There's pigment. And this is the left eye, very symmetric on the autofluorescence. Here's the OCT showing outer retinal loss in the macula, but normal in the center. And here's, so what's the diagnosis? You, I'm just going to tell you because you know it. If that's retinitis pigmentosa. So that's the most, that you're all going to see that. So if you're going to remember, in fact, my, I was to toying with the idea of just making this a retinitis pigmentosa lecture because the other stuff's just not common, but you do need to know a lot of the other stuff. Um, again, the prevalence is one in 4,000. 40% of patients come in with no family history. 30% will come in with an autosomal recessive history, 20% autosomal dominant, and 10% X linked. And that should add up to 100%. And there was a study that just came out um, in the last couple months where a group, I think in Spain maybe, looked at 877 patients with sporadic retinitis pigmentosa. And they did have one of these whole genome analysis and they were able to characterize the third of them about. And of the third they characterized, 84% uh, were autosomal recessive, which you would expect, but they did find autosomal dominant and X-linked. So these would be presumably either people who didn't know their family history or maybe a new mutation. Um, but you can see it's very uncommon. So if you have a sporadic retinitis pigmentosa, it's probably, there's, this is a third of the patients, so 8%. So there's probably a 1% or 2%. They could be a new manifestation of autosomal dominant, but it's unlikely. Um, the symptoms are nyctalopia, which is night vision loss and visual field loss. Try to think in the back of your head what day vision loss is, because that comes up later. That's something I would definitely put on the board. It's a weird word. Um, and then you find arterial narrowing, optic nerve pallor, bone spicules, and you do find vitreous cells, which is where you get the retinitis from. Optic nerve drusen and cataracts. So why do you get arteriolar narrowing? We talk, I love, I like, they find this fascinating. We talk about incompetence all the time, but I'm gonna talk about it again. It's because your retinal arterioles auto-regulate. The choroidal vessels don't do this, but the retinal ones do. They auto-regulate to control blood pressure and to control oxygen concentration in the retina. And this is the, where a lot of retinal diseases manifest because of these auto-regulation characteristics. In the retinitis pigmentosa, you have outer retinal atrophy. Your outer retina consumes an enormous amount of oxygen. So because the outer retinal is atrophic, you actually are getting more oxygen from the choroid at the level of the retinal vessels, and the retinal vessels narrow because they think you don't need the oxygen. Um, so that's why you get the narrowing of the arteries. And then the bone spicules are because of the outer retinal atrophy. So spicule is Latin for a tip of the wheat plant. And if you have any disease with photoreceptor atrophy, what happens is as the photoreceptors die, the retinal vessels end up touching the RPE. And then, the then once the vessels touch the RPE, the RPE cells migrate along the vessels and they cause the bone spicules. And histopathologically, they actually form tight junctions. That, you guys should not know this, but the, retina, the retinal pigment epithelium forms the outer retinal blood retinal barrier. So in the inner retinal blood retinal barrier is the capillary endothelium. So these RPE cells almost go and they try to make a blood retinal barrier. It's kind of an interesting behavior. These are diseases that are not retinitis pigmentosa that cause bone spicules. Tea's boiling. It's kind of noisy. Um, so if you look on the upper left here, does anybody know what that is? These are not that easy. This one's probably the easiest. It's got guttering. And then this one's got patchy um, 
um, bone spicules. This has this weird like pattern. Azor. What's that? So this one's azor. This one's got a pattern of bone spicules, and this has periphobial bone spicules. So think about it for a second. So this is chronic central serous, can cause these guttering outer retinal atrophy. Azor can cause these patches. This is an old retinal detachment that had spontaneously reattached. The patient didn't know she had ever had any trouble until she got macular edema. And this was an old detachment. And then this was a macular telangiectasia, where you can get these bone spicules along the vessels. And that was like Dr. Potler's case, where he showed the outer retina was gone. So you how, get this. How often does Azor have the, those patches? It's pretty much diagnostic. It, initially, it doesn't. The, the occult is because when they first present, they don't have the pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, but once they've been there for a while, they really should pretty much almost all get that. Um, so that's when I, when I, I have to say, I just throw it into Azor. When I have a, a pseudo RP that doesn't fit the other categories, it, it turns into Azor in my chart. Oh, and then this was an interesting one. I always like showing this case. The other, so atypical bone spicules, no family history, atypical retinitis pigmentosa, no family history, no bone spicules, asymmetric. Then you got to consider these other diagnoses, the ones we talked about on the other page, and also uveitis, syphilis, paraneoplastic syndrome, retinal drug toxicity, and ophthalmic artery occlusion. And this was a lady I showed at a conference a couple of years ago. No, a guy. This was a guy. Right eye was losing vision. Left eye was normal. The right eye was 24. 32, he had already had um, vitrectomy for floaters, he had had a macular pucker surgery, and then he had a Vastin injections, and he had laser. If you look right here, there's macular laser. And he came in with his, show pointing to the OCT, he wanted me to do another macular pucker surgery on him because he still couldn't see normally, and his macula was swollen, and he had syphilis. So actually, once we put him on penicillin, his vision got better. So be careful what you, you know, just try to get the right diagnosis. Uh, this is a normal electroretinogram. Again, I don't get these, but there's generally you get these five things. The dark adapted gives you the rod response. So the patient starts out dark adapted and you do a flash and you get this rise like that. The typical one you see is the light adapted, flash on a dark background. So they're light adapted, they get a single flash. This is your A wave and this is your B wave. So people talk about A waves and B waves, and that's the electroretinogram. The oscillatory potentials, I hate to say I don't know much about. The light adapted uh, flash on a light background is supposed to give you a single cone response, and then the flicker is good because only cones flicker. Rods are, rods are too slow. Rods are, take a long time to respond, and uh, they can't flicker faster than 20 hertz. So when you start flickering, your response is a cone response. So that's your ERG. And if you're going to remember something, it's the A and the B wave. And then I have some ERGs here. So this is a rod cone dystrophy ERG. Hey, Dr. Come on, real quick, that, before we get too far away from it, that RD, was that uh, RD or uh, serious RD? Oh, regmatogenous, I think. That looked regmatogenous to me. How often do you see that? Oh, I see probably one every three years where a regmatologist to had Hatchman spontaneously reattached and the patient didn't know they had it. And why do you think that would happen? Oh, the holes can close. You know, you can have these small, you can have these small holes where the, there's not a PVD and the vitreous probably plugs them and they close. There, you know, there's the retinal detachments are this fight. There's a vacuum, the RP is trying to suck the retina down and the fluid's trying to come through the hole. And if the hole's small enough, the flow can, also as the fluid gets under the retina, gets thicker, it doesn't flow in there. And eventually the RPE can win the fight and pull it back down and it, it reattaches. Cool. I've seen a number of those. Um, so this is your ERG. So this is a retinitis pigmentosa. Here's, no, this is, A wave is photoreceptors. B wave is the on bipolar cells. So in a, in a rod cone dystrophy, you expect reduction of the rod response first and the A and B wave reduced. Ultimately, the cone response gets exposed and then you see a prolonged time in the B wave and reduced amplitude. It may be undetectable. You don't need to repeat ERGs. This is out of the book. So once you get an ERG, if it helps you with your diagnosis, great. There's no reason to follow ERGs in patients. Um, and then this is retinitis pigmentosa. You just see it's attenuated. So this is that, that uh, bright flash one, and it's just lower. 
uh, management of rod cone dystrophy, there is this vitamin A palmitate thing where some, the Burson started this and people in Boston recommend vitamin A for uh, ER, for retinitis pigmentosa. The difficulty with this right now is we know that the patients with the ABCA4 mutation, which can cause a retinitis pigmentosa picture, are actually harmed by vitamin A. So before you give vitamin A, it would be nice to know the gene and also to make sure they don't have other problems. Do people uh, still use vitamin A, Steve? I thought that nobody used it anymore. No, people do sometimes. I have sometimes. I'll have patients come in. Do any of you guys use it? Any of the other staff that are still here? Not really. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Okay, hey, so yeah, I, most I, people don't. Hey, yeah, forget, but that, again, this is... This is desperate for something, but, I, I, you know, I, I, won't, I won't harp on it because there's such limited evidence for it. I talk more about the, getting the genetics and getting into a trial with a vector. Yeah, genetics is good. And then minimizing light exposure, I think, is a big one. There was a study done, which I thought was heroic, about five years ago, where they took five or 10 years ago, where they took about a dozen patients with Stargardt's disease, and they occluded one eye with a contact lens for a whole year, which is a very impressive study. And they found less slower progression. And there have been some animal studies supporting this. So in Florida, especially, everybody, I have to, I'll show you my cone dystrophy golfer patient. But um, you know, you want to keep people out of the sun as much as you can. And then the other thing that's a treatment now, which is approved for retinitis pigmentosa patients with very severe vision, is this retinal prosthesis. Um, the Argus one and the Argus two is now available. The thing you might take home from the Argus prosthesis is it has 60 pixels. So I'll have patients with macular degeneration come in and ask for the prosthesis. A normal retina has 125 million pixels. So by the time you get down to 60, there's really nothing left. So it's not an appropriate consideration for anybody other than light perception, retinitis pigmentosa. But there was a clinical trial and they had 38 uh, months of follow-up. They did the implant in one eye. It's interesting, the device was switched off as a control, which is very clever. Not many people improved vision. It was less, fewer than a quarter improved vision, but they actually were able to function better. So 60% were able to walk, this shows this walking to the door test. They stand 20 feet from a high contrast door and 60% were able to find the door with the thing switched on with 5% off. So it does help some with functionality of patients with very extreme retinitis pigmentosa. Um, this is another case, this is a 36 year old male. I think this is my doctor patient. Um, gradually declining vision, 20, 40 right eye, 20, 200 left eye, poor color vision. This is the right eye. And this is the left eye, and then here's the autofluorescence showing damage just in the center. And this is the OCT showing severe outer retinal atrophy. And this is a cone dystrophy. I did never got an ERG on him, but it's center, so it's a cone dystrophy. This is another one with a bullseye. There's over 25 genes that cause cone dystrophy. Um, you get a loss of color vision, hemorrhalopia is not a word we use much in the clinic, but it's a great word for the boards. And that means day blindness. Photophobia, they just don't like the light. The exam can be normal. They can have a bullseye, severe macular atrophy or temporal optic atrophy. This was, I remember Lawton Smith was, I'm sorry, I always get to miss up the governor and the neuro-ophthalmologist. I think it was Lawton Smith down at Baskin Palmer used to say that the, they, this was before the days of OCTs, patients would come in with unexplained vision loss and they would be bounced back and forth between the neuro-ophthalmologist and the retina clinic. And he said what would happen is people would be out on the beach and they would have sudden vision loss and then they'd go in and look up the phone number and call the clinic because when they were in the dim lighting, they could see the phone number, but in the bright lighting, they can't see. So if you have someone where they're very poor function in bright lighting, that's the Cone dystrophy. Oh, with Is that? Just a quick note, if I may, uh, with um for the residents, when you're asking about hemorrhalopia, how you ask about it is pretty critical. And what I was told, and I think it's it's been helpful for me, is to ask patients specifically, do you see better on a cloudy day as opposed to a sunny day? And that can often bring that symptom out, that of hemorrhalopia. Oh, that's a good way to do it. I like that. Yeah, I've, I've heard for the, um, I've heard for uh, night vision, it's supposed to be movie theaters. How do you do navigating? Although no one's going to movies now, but you, when you could go to movies. 
how to do Navigator Movie Theater, but that's a good one, cloudy versus bright. Um, you can do an ERG. The ERG can be undetectable or normal. The cone flicker is going to be abnormal. Um, the scotopic can be normal, but the photopic will be abnormal. And you know, an interesting thing, which is always fascinating to me, is the cone dystrophies, you end up losing your rods eventually. And the rod dystrophies, you do end up losing your cones eventually. And that has been talked of as a treatment strategy where there's definitely something where they interrelate. And if you lose one, you can uh, lose the other, hopefully. Um, Leber's congenital amaurosis is uh, severe vision loss when you're young. There are three autosomal dominant genes and 18 autosomal recessive genes identified. They have wandering nystagmus, ocular digital reflex for rubbing on it. The fundus may look normal because when they're born, they don't have bone spicules yet and um, central macular atrophy is common. This is one where genetic testing is critical because there is a treatment, um, which is Luxterna. Lux, Lux it was approved in late 2017. This is the first gene therapy for a, any disease, not just an eye disease. There was a previously approved genetic therapy which had to do with cancer treatment, but this was the first genetic therapy that was uh, approved for a mo monogenetic disease anywhere in the body. Um, a majority of participants were able to complete a course in low lighting. Um, let me see. Do I have the course? I don't have the course. So what they did was they, they implant the gene. You have to be over, older than one. It's a surgical implantation. And then there's a mobility course that they test the patients on. And it's pretty impressive that they can walk through a mobility course. And hopefully this will now turn into other treatments. This is a picture of enhanced s cone syndrome on one of my patients that I only diagnosed after I got the genetic test. So this patient over here did have the NR2E3 gene defect. Otherwise, I don't know what's distinctive about that other than it doesn't look quite like retinitis pigmentosa. Um, s cone syndrome, they have short wave plane cones are normal. They have an overabundance of the blue cones, reduced red and green cones, and almost no functional rods. And it's also Goldman-Fave syndrome. They have night blindness, sensitivity to blue light, which is weird, hyperopia, and pigment retinal degeneration. This is one of the causes of macular retinoschisis. So this in juvenile retinoschisis can cause macular, but it's not present all the time. Retinoschisis might be present. And they have this distinctive ERG where this is a normal here. This is a light adapted, dark adapted, light adapted, with a different signal and then the flicker and then the blue light adapted and the red light adapted. And you look at the patient with enhanced s -crone syndrome, everything's messed up, but then you get to this blue one and it's actually normal. So the, uh, it, but the thing about that test is most places can't do it. And I hate to say it at the moment, I don't think USF does that specific test because I had some patients I wanted to get it on. I'm not sure if this is correct, but uh, in my mind, I, there, I'm associating uh, enhanced S cone with some like torpedo findings, or no, that's a Gardner syndrome. That's Gardner. Is a, is a different syndrome with colo, colon polyps. Um, okay, choroidal dystrophies. I have to pick it up a little bit. Um, mostly this is choroideremia, but there are other ones. So, choroideremia, gyrate atrophy, Bietti's crystalline dystrophy, autofluorescence is helpful in watching progression. This is a patient with choroideremia. This is different from the one we saw before. Um, oh, great. Um, they have night blindness, peripheral vision loss. Usually the age is middle age. So they, a, lot, this, a lot of these dystrophies, I have to say, it does make my heart sink when I see someone who comes in not knowing they have a retinal dystrophy. Because I, you see people with pretty advanced retinitis pigmentosa or choroideremia come in you know, my vision's fine. And then you have to sit down with them and say, well, no, your, your eye's not healthy. Um, and the lar large choroidal vessels are preserved and visible. They have normal appearing retinal vessels and no optic atrophy. And then the fluorescein angiogram is distinctive. Like we showed, they have these scalloped areas that are missing. ERG is abnormal or extinguished. And then genetics, they have an X-linked mutation in the CHM gene. I don't think you need to know the genes at this minute, but you might. That one I think is actually in the textbook. Um, and then an interesting thing with choroideremia is I do have one female patient and they get this lionization, like a calico cat, where they'll have patches of the retina that are abnormal, even though they don't manifest totally. They do tend to manifest later. And there are a number of genetic trials for choroideremia. 
And then gyrate atrophy is uh, night blindness by the age of 10, loss of sight and central vision, macular edema is uncommon, and they get this paving stone-like area of atrophy. Autosomal recessive, but it does, um, there is a gene defect in this which can be treatable. So it's the gene for ornithine aminotransferase, which gives you elevated ornithine. And if you restrict arginine and vitamin B6, it might help the vision. This is a patient of mine I was pretty sure had gyrate atrophy. It ran through the family. And I have to say, I saw the patient a long time ago, and I, didn't, I pulled the chart up and I tried to contact them again, but it was a long time ago. They, were, they never came back. They were convinced they had retinitis pigmentosa, and when I told them it was a different diagnosis, it was weird, they got upset, and um, I kind of lost them. But this is the typical scalloped areas, and um, the macula is spared until later in the disease. And you can see the retinal vessels. It doesn't really look like retinitis pigmentosa. The optic nerve's not pale. There are some bone spicules, but not really the big thing is these big patches. So that's... Um, that's gyrate atrophy. And then Vietti's crystalline dystrophy, I do not have a picture of. The age of onset is 20 to 40. You get nyctalopia, which is true of all these. You get the crystals in the posterior retina and peripheral cornea, and it's autosomal recessive. Um, so that's uh, diffuse dystrophies and choroidal dystrophies we've talked about. And now we'll get on to macular dystrophies, which is mostly Stargardt disease. So start, these are pretty easy. Stargardt disease is, these I think are almost pathognomonic, even though the book didn't say. Um, Stargardt and Best have a very distinct appearance. Early onset drusenoid pattern dystrophies are in here. Those are more of a macular degeneration thing. And then occult macular dystrophies. I have a case, but I didn't put it in the lecture. Actually, I have two. Um, this is a 63-year-old man with you know, these flecks all over the place and some atrophy near the fovea. It looks a lot like macular degeneration except not exactly. And then the left eye has this atrophy and then flex in the back of the retina. And they call them pisciform flex in, you know, for fish, which is Pisces. And really it's just the tail. It doesn't, they don't look like fish to me. So the pisciform doesn't mean the flex look like a fish, but you're supposed to see maybe a fish tail. The other word I like is triradiate. And so we used to call them triradiate flex. And what I was taught a long time ago was that if you even find one, it's Stargardt. So if you look at a patient who has spots, you're like, oh, there's a spot, there's a spot. And then you're like, no, no, that's a triradiate spot there. You know, this eye, maybe there is triradiate. And once you find one, you've got your diagnosis. And the left eye, and it doesn't matter which eye it is. So, and you can use autofluorescence, which I love for Picture. So this is clearly this triradiate spot here, and those are diagnostic for Stargardt's. Um, so Stargardt's disease is the most common juvenile macular dystrophy. It can be very different. So this is a mild case, and this is a severe case of Stargardt's. It can look, you know, the macula can be shot. They get foveal atrophy, pisciform flex, a dark choroid. The dark choroid, again, I don't get many angiograms, so I don't have an example of this. The other thing is the dark choroid doesn't appear when they get older. It tends to, as the retina burns out, you don't see the dark coid. But if you have a young patient, you know, the dark coid used to be a big deal for trying to diagnose Stargardt's in a young patient. Now we have OCT and autofluorescence and genetic testing. Um, autofluorescence shows, this is the one disease that has elevated background autofluorescence because the disease involves with, is from liposomal storage, from uh, lipofuscin storage, not liposomal. Um, the thing we do not have yet, which I'm hoping we'll have sometime in the next decade, because they seem to move so slowly, is we can't do absolute autofluorescence. So when you look at autofluorescence in an image, you're looking at relative autofluorescence, and that doesn't give you an idea of increased autofluorescence in star guards, because the staff, whoever's shooting your picture is adjusting it to optimize contrast. But someday, it would not be that hard to have absolute autofluorescence. If we have that, that would help for star guards. Full field ARG can be normal. It's slowly progressive usually. The genetic, there's this ABCA4 gene, which is autosomal recessive. Or no, that, I think that's, I'm not sure about that. So that's, the, that's one of the common gene defects. That may actually be dominant. You, again, you want to avoid vitamin A. And the treatments, there are treatment trials. There's stem cell trials, there's gene therapy trials. There's also a trial of a medication to try to uh, reduce lipofuscin. Accumulation, I think by interrupting the vitamin A metabolism. 
Um, so that's, so Starbrush does have a number of treatment trials underway. Best disease has this typical look, a yellow egg yolk in the middle. It's a young patient. You want to watch trauma in these patients. Usually, um, and then up to 30% of patients have extrafobial, so not, they're not always in the center. So you can see them in the center, you can see them over here. Vision's usually better than you would expect, 2030 to 2060, and it can stay that way. I, I was seeing an old, you think you finally retired, a medical doctor from uh, north of me who had best disease. I actually think two medical doctors, and they saw fine. They were practicing, one of them didn't even realize he had an eye problem, which is a little weird. Um, but the best disease patients can see pretty well. The, this is the one that has the EOG that's severely abnormal and the ERG is normal. Uh, molecular genetics are better than electrophysiology. Oh, and the autosomal dominant defect is the best one gene. I guess the, yeah, the ABCA4 is the recessive and the best one is the autosomal dominant gene for best disease. Um, and then what I, the other thing I have not seen in a book, but I tell my patients because I read it somewhere and I've experienced it, because you see these patients when they're young and they really should avoid trauma. So when they want to be basketball or football stars or whatever it is they want to do, if they can avoid injury, because that does probably contribute to vision loss in the scrambling of the egg. Uh, Drusen eye macular dystrophy. I haven't seen many of these here. I saw one in Miami. This is somebody else's picture from my website. Um, there's familial or autosomal dominant drusen, large colloidal drusen. This is Malatia levantinis, and then Dwayne honeycomb dystrophy. And you get these radial extensions. If you look at this image, they look like drusen. So you're like, oh my gosh, look at all those drusen. What you want to do is look at the edge, and you see how it almost looks like a paint splatter there. So these drusen, it looks like someone dropped them and they splattered. That's the radiating. You can see these fine lines of radiating drusen from the middle lesion. So the radial extension of small and intermediate deposits is typical for this problem. And then cuticular drusen is also considered part of a dystrophy. That was like Dr. Finlay's patient, a cuticular drusen. And some people do throw those in because they occur at a pretty young age. Um, and then sores vis macular dystrophy, I've not seen. Autosomal dominant, um, normal vision until age 40. You get bilateral in the avascular membranes, and the macular lesions look like geographic atrophy, and they have a lot of black. It's, it's, Soresby's is very black and clumpy. Um, pattern dystrophy is extremely common. I think 10% of my macular generation patients are pattern dystrophy as, as much as that. Um, it comes, the reason, the way you differentiate from macular generation is it tends to come on younger. So you tend to see it in 50 year olds or younger. It's autosomal dominant, and you get these little yellow spots or little pigment spots, and their deposits are usually above the RP. And we'll show these cases in conference, but macular degeneration, you get drusen below the RP. They're deep to the RP. And pattern dystrophy, the deposits are above the RP, which is much different. There's these different types. There's adult onset fovea macular, which is this one. Butterfly, which is this one. Reticular is it looks kind of spottier. And fundus pulverolescent is this coarse pigment modeling. This lesion here is a butterfly dystrophy. And what you want to imagine here is a wing. So here's the butterfly's body. And then this would be a wing. And then this would be a wing. So that's where you get the butterfly. I remember Dr. Gass had a whole collection. He had duck dystrophies. He didn't like the term butterfly dystrophy. He liked pattern because he had a bunch like race car, I don't know the sports car dystrophy. It's like any, you could call that like a little race car dystrophy there, and, and this could be a, you know, so basically pattern dystrophy is accepted terminology. And then there are other macular dystrophies. This is central areolar choroidal sclerosis or dystrophy, North Carolina, occult macular dystrophy. I have a patient who's got late onset retinal degeneration. I've been following for a while, which is a, a macular dystrophy where they get neovascular membranes. So there are like, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of these diseases, but these are kind of the big ones that we've covered. Oh good, I think we're gonna finish. So those are your macular dystrophies. Again, when you're looking at diffuse dystrophies, it's mostly retinitis pigmentosa. The choroidal dystrophies are mostly choroideremia and macular dystrophies are mostly star guard disease. And then interretinal dystrophy is pretty short. It's just X-linked retinoschisis, it's got its own category. So X-linked retinoschisis, you find foveal schesis is the deeper retinal layers. Peripheral retinoschisis you see in the nerve fiber layer, and you see this in 50% of patients. 
my understanding of the disease, my reading is that everybody gets foveal stesis and 50% get peripheral stesis. They can get a vitreous hemorrhage and they, can, they will get absolute scotomas if you want to monitor by perimetry. Honestly, with our wide angle imaging now, I find that more useful to monitor. The ERG has a normal A wave, but reduced B wave. Because remember that B wave is the on-centered bipolar, on, center on bipolar cells, and they have this disconnect in the middle of the retina. So the A wave will be normal and the B wave will be flatter. There is, there is a gene for this, so there is a clinical trial underway. Um, my, here's an eight-year-old child who saw me for just vision loss 2040, 2050. This is the color pictures, and you can see the phobia doesn't look quite right if you look really hard at it. I have to say, examining children, examining the pictures is way easier than examining the patients. And then this is an OCT through the peripheral retina where you can see splitting of the nerve fiber layer. And then here's an OCT through the macula where you see the, the sclesis cavities are deeper. Um, and then this is not my patient's um, ERG. But here you see the, the rod response is flat, the cone response, you're getting something, oscillary potentials are flat, and then your flicker is normal. So you get the normal, normal cones in the middle, but everything else is kind of messed up. Um, and that's it for retina schesis. The other thing with, I'm gonna warn you with this, because I, 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 some retina person who's not in the area anymore is a really, really smart retina person. I kept him from doing a vitrectomy for a retinal detachment on a patient, because the, the history you'll get sometimes is a six, seven, eight-year-old boy comes in with the injury because six, seven, and eight-year-old boys are constantly getting whacked and beat up and they punch each other and, and they get a vitreous hemorrhage in one eye and your B scan looks exactly like a retinal detachment. So what you get is you get a vitreous hemorrhage, a B scan that looks exactly like a retinal detachment and a kid with a history of trauma and you're like, okay, we got to figure out what to do with this kid. Do we take them for buckle or vitrectomy or whatever. And my, the recommendation, I would, if this was an exam question, the correct answer would be to get an OCT of the other eye. Um, because if there's a good chance that's not a retinal attachment, it's retinoschesis, and a vitrectomy would be inappropriate. I actually do have one patient who had a vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage and retinoschesis, and, um, and I think it was because they thought there was a retinal attachment. But um, if you could avoid vitrectomies in kids, it's great because they don't always go well. And you can save the kid from getting a cataract. So, Steve? Uh, uh, yes. This is the, uh, let's see if I can do the. I can hear you. Video here, but uh, anyway. Oh, do you want to share your screen? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, I remember years ago, I was over at All Children's and I had a young kid. I was doing EUA on, and I saw the elevated membranes, and I thought it was a detachment. And I guess I thought I saw a break someplace, so I did a cryospot. And I looked at it, and I said, "That's weird." I guess, <laughs> lightning. I said, "I shouldn't." I mean, it's a detachment; it, it shouldn't whiten under until it reaches the detachment, right? Right. And so I thought about it, and I said, "Oh, it's retinoschisis." And I stopped. Good. It's always good. Yeah, I, when I was doing more pediatric surgery, I got in the habit of examining the kids right prior. I, there was a vitreous hemorrhage kid once. I followed for two months. I took the kid for a vitrectomy, and I said, why don't I just look one more time? And it actually had cleared, and I actually had him extubate the kid and wake him up and not do the surgery. So yeah, it's, you can learn stuff interoperatively that is helpful for your surgical planning. I have the knowledge. And I actually was smart enough on that day to use it. Right. It's good to know. And nowadays, I have to say, the OCTs have made a lot of this so much easier. Because yeah. now, the, if, in, in the OCT, realize your OCT uses an infrared light. And kids that will not do anything will often do an OCT because it doesn't bother them because it's, it's not a regular light. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you can't get an exam, you can often get a macular OCT on a six, seven, eight, nine-year-old, not on a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. So any other questions about dystrophies? Thank you for attending. Yeah, oh, you know, we need, 